Do you okay. need anything other than the muscle meat of large ruminant animals, associated fat, and additional fat in the form of largely saturated animal fat to do well and to thrive? No, you don't. Do you need organs? No, you don't. Do you need fruit and honey? No, you don't. So I went from 1,800 calories to 6,000, 6,500 in that range every day without fail for 14 days in a row. And I lost 15 pounds. I think the carnivore diet correctly formulated is absolutely the most important thing a person can do to increase their lifespan, their health span, their experience of life in general. We are absolutely, without question, biologically adapted to an obligate hypercarnivore lifestyle as a species. Mm -hmm. All right, welcome. We've got uh, the one and only... The Professor Bart K with us today is it's, uh, joining us, uh, presumably from New Zealand. I assume, unless you've transported yourself recently. So, how are things? How are things today down in uh, the land of the long white cloud? How are things going down there? Yeah, it's beautiful. It's a midsummer's day. We have ten o'clock in the morning. We have nice warm temperature already. Everything's on the up and up. It's good. Nice, nice. Yeah, one one of these days I'm going to get back down there. Like I said, I was on there 30 years ago when I did the rugby thing, and just a neat place. I'm glad. It seems like some of the insanity that that New Zealand went through from the last two three years has died down, and maybe saner people have taken that the grown ups have got the reins back, hopefully. But. Anyway, so Bart, Bart, did you have a specific topic you wanted to share today? There's been a lot of developments in recent times. I think some interesting things we can certainly get into unless you had a specific topic you wanted to discuss. Uh, yeah, you bet, Sean. I'm, we, we have been about the carnivore diet, what it's about, and communicating about the carnivore diet with folks for five years and upwards. And pretty much I think we've got this thing squared away. I really do. Do you okay. need anything other than the muscle meat of large ruminant animals, associated fat and additional fat in the form of largely saturated animal fat to do well and to thrive? No, you don't. Do you need organs? No, you don't. Do you need fruit and honey? No, you don't. Do you need to count so-called heat units of so-called energy? No, you don't. This is pretty straightforward. I think we're pretty done with this. I certainly am. Uh, yeah, you can listen to that interview from 1957 where Stefanson said the exact same thing. Balanced diet, meat plus fat, and that's all you need. And I, I, I fully agree with that. Hmm. Of course, you have people that prefer their preferences to do something else, and that's fine, too. I, I don't begrudge them that, that opportunity if they want. They, they just they live with the consequences, be it good or bad for them, and that's besides one. But I do think that, as Stefanson said, meat with adequate fat is a complete balanced diet. That's all you need. That's, that is sufficient for human physiology. I think all humans basically have the same, we have different eye color, and, but we're basically the same. We basically run on the same platform. We use the same operating system or whatever analogy you want to use. So I think that's fair enough. There is obviously, we live in this time of social media where everybody wants, they, they need the attention. And so they'll do, they'll talk about some new fangled thing to get people's interest because we all have the attention span of freaking fruit flies and it's like just, just stick to the basics and you'll probably have a a good outcome but i think i got a laugh i was involved in a i don't even want to call it a debate a spectacle with a couple of knucklehead vegan guys which <clears throat> i literally i was my presence there was near merely superfluous I, I didn't even have to say anything literally i did let's hear do you just talk for half an hour and you know you debunk yourself Anyway, and I saw, I appreciated you did a little play-by-play uh, -play of that. I watched some of that. I had a good chuckle with that. But anyway, it's it's entertaining. I'm glad I would provide some entertainment for you and your audience. And I have, suppose, supposedly I was going to do another debate today with Dr. Garth Davis, but apparently he had to reschedule for, so we're, we've just delayed that on to sometime in January. So I'll be looking forward to the critique of that one as well. And I, I saw fair points. You pointed out where I maybe had some errors, perhaps. Going back, when I, in retrospect, I, there was a couple questions that, I wish I watched it one more. I watched it again. I said, I should have said this at this point. Not that it would matter. These people are absolutely in, insane, right? They're just, mm. they're clinically insane by every definition you'd think of. It's, hey, I just, I just shot up a school full of children. Is that person insane or not? Yes. By the very nature that they did that, they are insane. But one of the things he was pointing at, he's trying to, he's trying to bait me into saying, would you, what is the difference between a human and a, and a pig that makes you different? Yeah. And at the very, I don't know if you remember at the very beginning of that interview, I said, hey, if, there's, if I'm driving a car and there's a rabbit and a kid, I'm going to yeah. swerve and hit the rabbit 
And every one of them agreed to it. I'm like, I should have said, why did you not just hit the kid? What's the difference? Why would you not hit the kid versus a rabbit? That would have, you know, basically been the same argument, but I forgot to do that. So anyway, yeah. obviously I know your thoughts on the debate, but I don't know if you have any other further comments on commentary on that. I think Nick Hebert went into kind of hiding. He like deleted all the social media. <laughs> Which well, I, I hope he funny. does. I, I really do hope that Nick Hebert does delete all his public appearances, all of his social media, and does remain silent for all time. Basically, this is a boy with delusions of grandeur and basically with delusions, full stop, period. Um, Maybe it's uh, <laughs> to, to canola honest, oil Sean, toxicity of the brain and who knows Oh, my what. God. To be honest with you, Sean, Nick Hebert actually needs help. I really believe he needs help. I think he's a very young, well, young man and, and should probably go and seek that kind of help. But that's for another day. It was amusing. He made it fair game by putting himself out there. I think he did a great job. What uh, Just on this thing, because I just, not to belabor this point too much, but if your worldview is literally that 99.9% .9 of every human you run into is an evil, monstrous murderer, how do you function in that society? It's, when I meet people, I at least give them the, about, the benefit of the doubt that they are normal, good, ethical. Maybe they're not. Maybe most people are knuckleheads, but still at the same point. When you literally think everybody around you is a raving, murderous, bloodthirsty, rapist, savage, horrible, awful person, mm. how do you function in society? I don't think you do. I don't think you do either. I think you end up doing what Nick Hebert does, which is hide in his mummy's basement, having a tremendous little party with all his like-minded, equally dysfunctional, mostly young men who think themselves awfully, awfully, awfully clever. I don't know. Let, let me get your thoughts on this latest count. I, I imagine you're, you've been you've, you've seen this uh, the so-called lean mass hyper responder study that just uh, Dave Feldman, Matt Budoff at UCLA yeah. just presented uh, to yeah. wide. I don't know if I want to call it a claim, but a lot of people are talking about it. Certainly, it's got its, mm. it's obviously it's got its proponents. It's mm. got its detractors. There's over it's over interpretation. There's disregard. Yeah. This quite condescending, sneering disregard of it. Did you, did that, was that, what did you, what's your takeaway from that, if you okay. don't mind sharing? So, no, absolutely. More than happy to talk about that. The lean mass hyper responder phenotype, so called, is a construct. It's an idea that's been put together by somebody, in this case, Dave Feldman, who, as it turns out, has training as a computer technician, a, a coding specialist, some kind of engineer of that kind, rather than health science, medical science, or any of that kind of stuff. Okay, whatever. The whole premise is that, look, here is a special population of people who need not worry about high cholesterol because there's something special about these people. They are lean mass hyper responders. They are excluded from the so-called risk or so-called danger of elevated low-density lipoprotein in particular. My problem with it is that is a begging the question fallacy in that it assumes that there is anybody in the world who need be concerned about elevated low-density lipoprotein because there isn't anybody that need be concerned by that. So you are a sort of cholesterol, LDL cholesterol is not an issue, more of an absolutist. Interestingly, I don't want to interrupt you too much, but interestingly, when I talk to Dave Feldman and Nick Nor, particularly Nick Norwitz, I said, how common do you think this phenotype is? And he says, quite honestly, I think it's very common. In fact, I think the majority of the people would put in the same situations, respond very similar. Maybe their LDL wouldn't reach 500, but it might mm -hmm. reach 220, which is mm -hmm. still considered dangerous as a thing. So it may be that's just a normal consequence. I mean, that, that whole response, and we see it all the time, low-carb diet, triglycerides drop, HDL may go up, LDL may go up. That's pretty. That's a pretty common, generally conserved physiologic feature. And the question becomes, in my mind, at the very least, I'm at the point where I'm saying, I think LDL cholesterol is a dependent variable. And maybe it, you find it in a plaque, right? And it needs to be there for a plaque. And although they've discovered atheromas without it, which is interesting as well. Mm -hmm. But you could say that, okay, maybe it's part of the causal pathway, but it's not the only, it's not the initiating the initiator, it's not the, it's very much dependent upon the environment that it's placed upon. Yeah. And you're saying, hey, it, don't even worry about it at all. I don't care who you are, what you are, work on something else. And that may be true. Like I said, if you got some yeah. overweight, sedentary, diabetic, insulin resistant, inflamed, high blood pressure person with 
metabolic syndrome times five. And you say, just work on a metabolic disease. Just get lean, stop eating sugar, whatever, fix your glucose. Yeah. Then that LDL falls out of the, it becomes also non-contributory. Is that, yes. in your opinion, or using whatever scientific, scientific rationale you have, if LDL is not the causal factor for heart disease, heart disease clearly occurs. Something's causing it. There's, it's happening. Yes. Why? why? Why are we seeing that? Is it Malcolm Kendrick's uh, hypercoagulability? Is it inflammation? Is it some, some combination of the above? If LDL is not the variable that is, as most of medicine is LDL, yeah. myopically focused, it's LDL, it's LDL, it's LDL. Yeah. The analogy I use is, yes, okay, if you have to have LDL to have a have an atheroma, or have atherosclerotic disease, then we should just lower it down to zero. That's what we're being told. We see Thomas Day Spring and some of these other knuckleheads. Mm. We need to get LDL down as low as humanly possible. Let's get it. Let's slam PCSK9 inhibitors and bempedoic acid and statins mm. and uh, azetembine and everything in there to get it to zero, and you won't have heart disease. Mm. My response to that is sexually trans syphilis really sucks, and males can't have syphilis, so they don't have a penis. So let's just lop off penises and be done with it. It's just to me, it's the same analogy. Anyway, you've been listening to Nicholas too much, I think. <laughs> you think? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. this is very simple, Sean. It, it yeah. really is very simple. The analogy that I use often is that every single time you turn on the television and see a rampant forest fire burning, there will be shots on the nightly news of fire crews running around. Right. Ergo, what we need to do to deal with this forest fire scourge is ban fire crews because they're always there. Hmm. It's ridiculous. Yeah. So, so it, it, it is, the, is cool. I've heard that uh, it's cholesterol is the repair mechanism. It's the attempt at repair Correct. for underlying I mean, vascular damage. That's right. And it's, you yes. know, it's interesting. I mean, in some of the animal models, the way that they create atherosclerotic diseases, they friggin' run a, uh, like a wire brush in the vessel and scrape the hell out of it so that there's yeah. damage. And then only subsequent to that do they see this sort of macrophage, foamy macrophage, cholesterol inundation type of thing. So it's yes. an interesting concept. So and the absolute slam dunk, these are the facts, whether anybody likes them or not, they're still the facts. The underpinning etiological cause of atherosclerosis is inflammation of the vascular epithelial cells and mechanical damage mm -hmm. to those cells, yeah. possibly chemical damage as well. Yeah. So, so the inflammation things. would be smoking, hyperglycemia, mechanical yeah. damage would be a blood pressure phenomenon, which yes. is secondary probably to inflammation anyway. Yeah, sure. So that's the, and I certainly don't discount that, that sort of mm. pathogenesis sort of argument. And we'll see, like I said, obviously there is a lot of people out there, obviously your opinion, your sort of belief in this and your opinion and, and, and to a degree mine is not shared by the average lipidologist, the average cardiologist, most of them, 99% of them would say, we disagree based on associational data and right. Mendelian randomization studies and yep. mechanistic studies and on and on. But anyway, yep. Yep. Um, here's so another one. What they're unable to do is to actually provide any cause and effect evidence to support their hypothesis. Ergo, as scientists, if they were scientists, they, it would be their responsibility to reject their hypothesis on the basis that they cannot support it. Fair okay. enough. Yeah. yeah. So let me just, I want to, because I want to get through a couple of topics here. Interestingly, as you mentioned, I've been talking to Nick Norwitz quite a bit, and yeah. I think Nick's is generally a, a very good guy, and he's got some good things that he wants to do. And we're, we were actually working to, to secure some research and get some stuff done in, in, in regard to carnivore. But one of the things that he alluded to is this, obviously, is a lean mass type of responder study was it's just baseline data. Obviously, they've got the one-year data coming up. It'll be finished, collected in February, published subsequent to that, probably, I don't know, a couple months later, I'd imagine. Mm. But they've got a couple other studies in work, one that I think you will like, and he alluded it to me. He wouldn't give me details, but he basically said, we have a study involving saturated fat that I think Adrian Sotomota, I think the guy in Mexico uh, City has yeah. done, that will basically completely decimate the calorie argument. It's just, it's David Ludwig was privy to that data and is like giggling with angst, just can't anticipation. So I know you've been critical of the calorie model. And I, I, I like I said, it's a useful metric in a way that you can discuss things. You, know, you, can, you can talk about volume of food consumed, perhaps. I know, I don't know if you saw that, that little, little uh, presentation Mike Eads did uh, maybe 
three, four months, six yeah. months ago about yeah. mass rather than calories, which is it's, it's an interesting concept because, mm. like I said, the mass of a sugar cube is enough to enough energy to power 10 nuclear power plants or something like that. And we don't yeah. we obviously don't get that much energy out of that stuff. No. So energy is anyway, but another that should be coming out. What's that? Energy is another construct. It's another thing that actually lacks a scientific definition that's externally valid. Interesting. Yeah. So what do you, how, what is your parlance when you're talking about, how do I quantify what I'm eating? Because right. let me just say this, because I would 100% submit, and I've seen it over and over again. Somebody on a standard American diet goes carnivore. They can eat equal and, and oftentimes more calories and yet lose weight. I've seen yes. that over, and I could justify it say their the protein percentage went up higher, and there's this thermic effect and blah, 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 and there maybe there's this calorie insulin model that, that David Ludwig likes to talk about. Mm. But when I want to gain weight, I eat more food. That's what I do. If, if I eat five ribeyes a day, I'm going to weigh more than if I eat two ribeyes a day. So I'm eating a additional amount of massive food, calories yeah. of food, however you want to, however you want to put it that way. Mm. Yeah, it, it it really is down to not just the absolute mass of food being consumed on a daily basis versus the expenditure of so-called energy by metabolic process, exercise, etc., whatever else. It's also very much about the makeup of that mass. No, I don't and disagree that, with that. I don't disagree. But, but, is, but, is but all things given calorie, equal. The caloric model cannot account for because all calories are the same. Yeah, of course they're not. I totally get that. I'm just saying that if I eat 100% ribeye and I eat 500 grams versus 100% ribeye, 2,000 grams, yeah. that's going to have a differential effect on me. That's clear, right? It, it will. And one of the most notable effects it will have is on your endocrine hormonal system, and that will signal your body to set your metabolic gearing and the direction of your metabolic pathways up to run in a certain direction. Yeah. It's probably, massive. yeah. So it's not linear. Like I said, it's not, there's going to be shifts that occur. There's going to be compensations. There are going to be, and your point about output calories out, I can't control how much body heat. I, I, I cannot voluntarily dictate how much body heat my body emits so that's controlled right. by the environment stress the weather the temperature the food the quality of the types of food i'm eating the amount of protein i'm eating but yeah clearly there's differential effects on the the, the makeup of those calories i think that is incontrovertible mm -hmm. in my mind right yeah now, okay. I, I did an n equals one at the beginning of 2022 or 23 i can't remember if it was yeah. this year or last now I was so-called consuming so-called six and a half thousand calories a day mm -hmm. for fourteen days solid. Yeah. Where my how did you how did you feel doing that? By the way, Bart, just out of curiosity. Terrible. It was torture. hard to do. Yeah. It's hard to yeah, do, isn't really. it? If it was all meat, for sure. It's really hard to do. Yeah, meat and fat was all it was. And what happened in those fourteen days was that I shed. 15. Interesting. <laughs> now, my normal intake is under 2,000 calories a day. I'm a small framed individual. I'm 5'6, 138 pounds dripping wet. Mm. So I went from 1,800 calories to 6,000, 6,500 in that range every day without fail for 14 days in a row. And I lost 15 pounds. 12 and a half of that was water, the rest was fat. So, using calories in, calories out, please explain. Go. Yeah, I, I, I <laughs> no. can't easily do that for sure. What you happened know. was my inflammation dropped vastly. Ergo, I flushed out a bunch of water that my body was carrying that it didn't need. And while mm -hmm. I was there, it burned off some fat, even though I was consuming vastly more fat than I had been previously. Okay. Okay. I'm wondering why where the, the residual body. inflammation was coming from then at that point. Why were we dealing with inflammation? If, if because I've been eating badly before that. Ah, okay. You didn't mention that part. <laughs> okay. That, that makes more sense to me. At, at 1,800 calories. Yeah, but still, still inflammatory, water retention, inflammation retention type calories type of stuff. And I know you mentioned you lost Absolutely. actual fat but masses. These seco buffoons are telling us that calories in, calories out is the answer. It's the only thing you need to watch. You count your calories in and count your calories out. The problem, Sean, being is that How do you count the average out? Joe at home is unable to do either. You cannot yeah, measure I, your I calories in or your calories out. Yeah, no, I agree. It's very hard to accurately measure calories in because the labels are inaccurate. Yeah, it's just, it's just, it's hard to do. You can estimate it. Particularly if you don't eat anything, then it's then you're going to be pretty safe to say it's pretty much zero. But calories out, I don't know how you estimate calories out. Yeah, you can say I exercise moderately versus heavy, but again, that disregards 
basal metabolic rate, heat production, non neat yeah. non-exercise activity, thermogenesis, all those types of things that you can't really easily quantify unless you had a accelerometer that you walked around with all day long, which most of us don't have access to, right? No. You need to live in a fully closed bomb calorimeter system, right. wouldn't you? Right. So that right. we could, yeah. Right. It's not happening. So, so we don't have a lot of those studies that are so, I mean, the, done. the original question, Sean, was how do I tell people to gauge, put a metric on their food somehow? Yeah. My approach is quite different to a lot of people's. Here's what I say. Under no circumstances do you need to measure anything. Yeah. Your food in or your energy out or your weight, actually. None of these things need measuring. Here's what you do. Eat a fully carnivorous diet consisting almost entirely the muscle meats, no organs of large mm -hmm. ruminant animals and associated fat, additional fat as needed. Basically, it's 1.75 grams of protein per lean kilogram of body mass up to that's minimum, up to half as much again, depending on individual. You'll work that out in equals one over time. Eat up to satiety with fat. The only thing you're really keeping an eye on is when you feel hungry, you eat food, and food being as I've just described. And when you feel full, that means you've got enough food on board now, and you stop. Yeah, I'm, I'm full right now. I just had uh, two, pound, two, two and a half pounds of whatever, a kilo point something, 1.1 1 .1 kilos of fatty meat. When I'm done, I'm like, and I'm awesome. very much of the same mind. I, like I, when I'm counseling new clients, I will tell them, because they, they all want to know how much, how many grams of protein, how much fat, what are the percentage? You know, I'm very much very similar. I say eat enough so you don't want the cupcake or the pizza or whatever it is. Just eat enough so you don't want that stuff and let that run for three to six months. And, and then you probably don't even have to ask any more questions beyond that. Occasionally yeah. some people have some, but that's quite interesting. There's, what was the, other, there was another thing I wanted to get your insider thoughts on. Are you familiar with the new Chris Gardner's new study, Stanford University, twin, vegan twin, omnivore twin, 22 twins. Outcome measure was decrease in LDL cholesterol, cholesterol by, I don't know, 12 milligrams per deciliter, mm -hmm. an additional like kilo of, of mass of unknown unknown whether it was fat or lean and uh, a slight decrease in insulin and that means yeah. that's showing that the obvious superiority of the vegan diet over a omnivorous diet of mm. a diet that included more calories and more sugar quite honestly but anyway did you see that did you see that study and did you have yeah, any thoughts I, I on that i haven't looked at it with a fine tooth comb sean i have to admit i've been busy i've had a week away in uh, in Honolulu on the Cyril company. Oh, Thanks, Cyril, nice. for doing that for me. That was awesome until the flight home, but we'll get to that later if we get to it. The situation is that I agree that a vegan diet in the short term is vastly superior to the standard Western American omnivorous diet. The standard Western American omnivorous diet, even relatively clean omnivorous diet, is vastly inferior to any other diet other than no food at all. Yeah. So that's not a surprise. The comparator was always set up to make the vegan diet look good. What I'd like to see is a comparison of vegan versus 100% carnivore. We'll see which one of those ones wins in what regard. And well, of course, I'll, I'll just would not include LDL cholesterol because who cares? So yeah. what? Some people still care, but I will, one of the studies that I may have some capacity to make happen is going to be a RCT, a true RCT vegan carnivore, which I think that will be a quite a well popular study. It'll be it'll get a lot of airplay, I hope, because I think anyway. So we got that maybe coming down the pipe. There is in fact there was one other big important topic that I wanted to bring up and it's blanking me right now. So what you were you said you were in Honolulu. Was that first trip to Hawaii or had you been prior yeah, to first time I've been there. That's yeah, a nice place. I've been there a few times. Yeah. It's, it's quite a nice yeah. what what brought you there? You said something some group or something like that? Yeah, the the Cerule company. That's the company I'm joint ventured with in terms of the adult stem cell promoting uh, nutrition supplement it, that it. I've I been see. all about okay. for the last couple of years. Okay. And every year, except for the last two, where they haven't been able to do it for reasons unknown, shall we say, there's a trip to Hawaii that you qualify for with a certain sales volume. Uh, and it's the world elite. But it's actually not that stiff, the the level of sales that you need to achieve. Mm -hmm. it's, it's fairly achievable for almost anyone who wants to come to Hawaii next year. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, but right. they just lay on the week and everything's paid for and it was great. Yeah, it's it's it, uh, that that's... Honestly, one of my favorite places in the U.S. is Hawaii, just because mm. it's, it's, yeah, it's a tropical island, but it's still, you know, you're not dealing with some of the problems with 
some of the other places that sometimes it's crime. There's crime still in Hawaii, but it's pretty pretty low. Yeah. The yeah, I want I wanted to just touch on oh yeah yeah the organ meat thing this is something i've got people out there saying obviously the liver king saladinos and those people thinking that hey it's you need to be eating three baboon testicles and six mm. ostrich penises and 14 chicken brains a week to, to be optimal and primal and if you don't do that bad things will happen to you yeah. i know i'm embellishing a little bit but not far to be honest <laughs> yeah. you've got that going on You've got other people out there saying that actually organ meats are actually physically damaging people yeah. and we should be avoiding it at all costs because of things like vitamin A toxicity and so on and so forth. My sort of opinion is fairly agnostic. I will say I don't think they're necessary. I think, mm. you know, there's a reason why most, I don't know, most, I, I would say most people find them dis dis displeasurable. I think I think that's fair to say that most people find the, the taste off-putting. Some people don't, but 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 I think most people do. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that they don't taste good? It's, I think, embedded. It's an intrinsic part of our inborn instincts that we shouldn't be eating, in particular yeah. liver. Yeah. Now, a lot of people say the, the obvious problem with the liver is the vitamin A toxicity potential, as you've alluded to there, Sean. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's the problem. Mm -hmm. Actually, I'm not convinced on that one at all. To me, the problem with concentrating and, and, and indeed eating large amounts of liver is copper toxicity, mm -hmm. plain and simple. I believe that's what happened to our friend Salad Boy, among other things, that and not yeah. having enough protein in one whack in a day in a single meal, rather eating multiple times a day and taking in insufficient protein for his individual needs – that's what led him down the path of his issues, I think. It's interesting because at the very beginning, I when I was obviously the first guy to call it the carnivore diet. There were people that were doing meat-only diets well before me, and even going back to James Rolla in the friggin' 18th century, 1790s was doing this stuff. So I'm by no means the first person to talk about this. But Paul, when he talked with me, he was talking to me how he felt that these things are necessary based on USRDA vitamin requirements. I said, I don't think that really applies in this population. And I've got people that have been doing this already for 10, 15, and 20 years, all saying that they found in, in their own trial and error over years, they found that these things are not only not necessary, but in many cases detrimental, and yeah. most people give them up. And so he did a carnivore diet for supposedly a year and then was like, okay, I can't do it. And, and it may have been because of his dogmatic, dogged determination to include as much organ meats as possible based on what I think was a sort of a incorrect belief and or maybe more nefariously just in order to create a market for overpriced supplements. That mm. that could be a part of the well, issue. Well of course well. he was in business with the Liver King. And yeah, he still, I, yeah, I heard that so it's interesting. promotes the intake of vast amounts of liver. Uh, which is still a mistake, by the way. What do you think? Let me delve into that a little. Why do you think? What do you think the downside of it is? You mentioned copper toxicity. How does that yeah. present? What, what would we? What would give us any, a clue that hey, I'm consuming too much copper, or some people say vitamin A? Yeah, when your copper level is elevated above what it ought to be, your kidneys have to work so much harder to excrete the excess top of copper before it becomes toxic to you in terms of metabolic pathways, neural pathways, all sorts of things that can be adversely affected. And as such, your kidneys become very leaky and not only leak out copper, but a bunch of other stuff as well. And that throws and your electrolyte balance off and that causes all the issues that, that Paul that was, he was talking complaining about. Of. Okay, so, okay, so the rule of thumb for me is, look, if you feel you must eat liver, there's no reason for you to, but if you feel you must, here's what I would suggest. Look at the proportion of any given beast that is its liver in terms of the mass. Mm -hmm. So maybe on a cattle beast, you've got 200, 250 pounds, let's say, of muscle meat. Just well, it's closer. To, it's, the actual number is probably about 500, 550 pounds on a, is that on what a it is? finished on, cattle. On, yeah, on, yeah, that's what the usual yeah. meat is. Okay. I, 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 I talk to a lot of ranchers, so I know these details. Okay, Excellent. Yeah. Thanks for that. So 500 pounds of, of edible muscle meat. How much liver is there in a cow? So in a liver is about eight pounds, something All right, like so that. So what's the proportion of liver to muscle meat? Yeah, it's less than 1%, right? That's what you or should eat. It's a little over 1%, a little over 1%. So that's what you should eat yeah. if you're going to yeah. eat liver at all. 
Yeah. Fair enough. That makes sense to me. You know, now, now this is what I am <laughs> because when I pre- I presented that argument many times, I said, "Look, proportionally, there's way more muscle meat than there is liver or anything else." And what they what what, what I was told was humans preferentially killed animals just for their internal organs, and I I, I think that's just complete balderdash, poppycock, pop, yeah, pop, pop, whatever garbage. Yeah, that's nonsense. <laughs> because they'll point out to the the shark will eat the killer whale will eat a shark eat a whale's liver first or mm. a alpha wolf will go for the intestines or the, the organs my thought on that is they're probably going for where the fat is on the animal because this is the only place a lean animal has fat is in its in its perinephric fat it's a mental fat it's pericardiac mm. fat they don't have much mu- they don't have much fat on their limbs and in their on their thorax and so the only place that animal is going to get fat is through the intestines basically mm. and they, they don't really have access to the brain most of these animals these even cats can't really get into skulls um whereas a vulture might be able to a, a some of the other carrion feeders have the capacity to do that and then certainly maybe early scavenging humans with with the rocks and things like that mm. yeah so it's an interesting interesting thing where let me ask you this other question i see because this is another thing i see a lot of people eating lots and lots of butter on carnivore. Mm-hmm. You know, just, there, there's people that that's in their name, the, the so-and-so butter person. And what are your thoughts around that? Is that deleterious? Is it conditionally beneficial? Where do you go with that stuff? I add a reasonable amount of butter to most of my meat meals. Mm-hmm. Like anything, I think there's too much, there's too much of anything. Absolutely. And you can overdo it. Butter largely seems to be your short, chain fatty acids, mostly butyriate, funnily enough, butter, butyriate, there you go. Mm -hmm. Short chain fatty acids can be absorbed from the lumen side of the enteric system as butyric acid or butyriate, as it actually is, from butter. So that alleviates the so-called need for fiber to be transmuted to short chain fatty acids, and that takes care of feeding it from the lumen side. However, it's not necessary because you can still feed those enteric cells the butyriate that is required from the blood side. Mm, How do we do that? That's easy. Beta hydroxybutyriate. Yeah, hydroxyl molecule away. It's an OH molecule away. That's right. And in fact, if you consume butyric acid, either from butter or from the fermentation of fibers on the lumen side, the first step before it's metabolically useful is to transmute it to beta hydroxybutyriate, which if you feed it from the other side from the blood, we're talking about ketones, by the way, boys and girls, is what we're talking about here. Mm-hmm. It's taken care of. Yeah, there's an interesting paper. I don't know if you've seen it. Tommy Wood and Dr. Mailer, I can't remember her first name, did a paper, I think it was 2021, on metabolic flexibility of the gut because we're being told we must feed our gut fiber so the short chain fatty acids can be liberated to protect colonic mucosa and yeah. the health of the enterocytes and exactly what you're saying not only can you get that through beta hydroxybutyrate in a low carb diet but you can also get it through the the degradation of protein in the gut the same mm-hmm. thing rather than fermentation it's putrefaction it's an ugly word for protein breakdown but it the same mm-hmm. thing you get this you get short chain fatty acids and many propionic acid butyr a methyl butyrate, uh, things like that, that also serve the same purpose. And so they've conceded that, hey, fiber may not be necessary for this role, which I've been saying this for years, and I'm probably sure you have too. But so we're seeing more and more evidence. What we're seeing in the science is backed up what we've seen and I've seen clinically now for many years. And we're starting, like you said, the the science always lags two decades behind the reality in in many Mm -hmm. cases. And we still have people that are out there following the science from 1980. Science is one of those things that progresses one funeral at a time, Sean. Yeah, that was was that uh, Max Planck. I think you said that famously. Yeah. I believe so. Yeah, yeah. We got to wait for Absolutely. some of these clowns to die yes. off. Walter Willis will it to drop dead. I'm not wishing that, of course, anytime of course. soon. But this yeah. is when we see the changes coming in. But uh, yeah. I think social media is going to change that a little bit, though, because we have some loud platforms. We've got. I was just had the, the opportunity to be on Rogan's podcast, who he reaches more people than basically anybody on the planet just about. And there are countermeasures out there that we might be able to, might not have to kill so many scientists to get the message out there. Hopefully, I'm hoping anyway. Cool. 
What else can we talk about, Bart? The Oh, here's one thing that I personally have seen when it comes to, because a lot of people are, too much protein is bad for us. It's going to drive mTOR and, and kill us and age us and give us cancer. Mm-hmm. Uh, versus there's a group of people that will say, you need protein to build muscle. You need protein for lean mass. You need it to function. Every association study that shows that more muscle mass is associated with XYZ good outcomes. And yeah. there are people that are lipophores. They'd say, we need just lots and lots of fat and protein is kind of one of those things where we need enough, but not too much. I've seen in my own clinical experience, a tendency for certain conditions and people to respond better to a slightly higher fat approach. Do you think there is some variation within the carnivore spectrum on who needs a little more fat and who needs a little more protein? Does that jive with what you've observed? It makes perfect sense to me as well, because like I was quoting numbers before, 1.75 grams of protein per kilogram of lean body mass, baseline minimum, up to perhaps 1.5 times that, depending on your size, gender, age, stage, Mm -hmm. activity level, training status, stress and distress levels, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Absolutely, there is a range. So less than that seems to be problematic. Just look at the vegans. More than that seems to be problematic in terms of gluconeogenic effect, weight gain, A1C drifting up over time, FBG going up over time, etc. So there is absolutely an envelope of the right amount of protein. Hmm. Yeah, And it seems to be that if you listen to your satiety signaling, once you've been on Carnival for about six months and you've got that retrained, it's that's the most accurate gauge of how much protein you should be eating. Well, it seems like we should have some sort of internal feedback net mechanism. Every other species on the planet has that. Mm-hmm. Why would we not have something that would lead us to how much are you supposed to eat? When are you supposed to eat? Should be it shouldn't Precisely. require a PhD level to figure out how the hell to eat as a human. Here's another sort of controversial topic that, that has seen a little bit of attention. I don't know if it's come to your attention yet. I think it's particularly driven by uh, Dr. Robert Sibus, who you may or may not know. He's the carb addiction doctor. He calls himself that. He's been talking about this concept of insulin suppression, that if you go zero carb for too long, you're going to have basically physiologic insulin suppression that is bad. Mm -hmm. And I guess it would lead to a like a type 1 diabetes type syndrome, whereas insulin does have a role. Insulin does more than just move glucose into the cell. It stores fat. It stores, it helps us to build muscle. And if we have very little insulin or not enough insulin, we're going to start to fall, basically fall apart. Just like a type 1 diabetic that basically wastes away to nothing. Any thoughts on this insulin suppression concept? Yeah, I don't buy it personally. I am of the mind with many of these physiological signals, second messenger systems, hormone-like systems, indeed the hormone system itself, that all of these things are under the control of your genes. Those genes reacting at that time to the environment in which those genes are placed in order to optimize the physiological function and homeostasis of the individual. Your body knows what it's doing. All of these changes to insulin production, insulin withdrawal, the effect of insulin on the GLUT4 transporter, etc. They are all moderatable via other processes that play into that as control levers precisely because they are supposed to do that. It is adaptive. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. It's the sort of the example that he shared in his video was a guy who went carnivore, got ripped, got lean, by all accounts was clinically doing well. But his lab showed a couple of disvariances, like a little bit of elevation. And I think I can remember his, one of his liver enzymes was up and maybe one of his triglycerides were up a little bit. And he said, aha, this is insulin resistance or insulin yeah. suppression rather. Yeah. And do this and this and we can fix your labs. And, yeah, I, you know. I actually did a response video to that particular video that, okay. that Rob okay. Simon's put out. And basically, the error that Rob makes, in my opinion, is relying entirely on the value from a lab Right. Yeah. As a prognostic, diagnostic, and indication for intervention requirement. The, the, the subject, the bloke that he was talking about, had no symptomology of problem of any kind whatsoever. Yeah. His yeah. labs were a bit off, according to what Rob decided they ought to be. So yeah. Rob made a decision as a clinician, I need to intervene here. 
And I repeatedly said in my video to him, no, Rob, you did not. In fact, the Hippocratic Oath requires you not to. First, well, do no harm. Yeah, I think if you have a clinical diagnosis of something, call it diabetes, call it heart disease, call it mm. insulin suppression, you need to have some sort of clinical sequela that you can validate that with. It's not just sure. a lab-only diagnosis, in my view. Maybe mm. I'm wrong on that, but I think, yeah, you can name it. You can call anemia a lab value. Yeah, you've got low blood count, but it has a consequence. And and what is the consequence of this? If what I'm understanding is true about insulin suppression, we have inadequate insulin, then the things you would expect to occur are loss of lean mass, probably ravenous hunger, that type of stuff like you see with a type 1 diabetic. I've been basically effectively zero carb for eight years now. I have not lost lean mass. In fact, I've gained lean mass. I'm stronger now at nearly 57 than I was at 47. And that you know, that is not consistent with this long-term, low-carb insulin suppression uh, oh, model. Oh, yeah, but that, Sean, that he, you have low testosterone, apparently. It's interesting because <laughs> I do, I get that all the time. And then I, I set one set of labs back in yeah. early 2018. It was low. It was like, I think my total was like two something, 250, yeah. 230 something. Mm -hmm. And that's clinically below the threshold of the reference range. But at the same time, I'm deadlifting 500 pounds. Hard training workout. I've tested it subsequent to that and it was higher it still wasn't super high but it was higher it was normal range and i i'm of the opinion and, and not just because i'm making this up that testosterone number has to be taken in context of what's going on clinically and also has to take into account the sensitivity of the receptors so it's like we we mm -hmm. readily acknowledge that there's insulin resistance oh there, there's this serine residue that impacts the glut 4 receptor and so on and so forth but when we say we have androgen receptors and they're subject to sensitivity, resistance, just like anything else, mm -hmm. we pretend we don't, we've never heard of that before. Mm -hmm. And that, that clearly is the case. Stu Phillips, 2018 paper, looking at young athletes doing resistance training, found that they're literally their serum hormone levels didn't matter what it was, growth hormone, free testosterone, sex binding globulin, DHEA had no bearing on their ability to put on muscle. The only thing that mattered in that particular study was the density of the androgen receptors. And that was it. So, and again, I, that's something that I laugh about because they accuse me of having the testosterone of an old grandma and then they accuse me of being on steroids on the same day. It's just like, okay, come on, guys. Which is it? What's it going to be? Yeah. Correct. Funny. Absolutely not. So, yeah, I'm not a fan of labs for the sake of labs. I'm not a fan of looking at the levels in the serum of pretty much anything unless the clinician is of the opinion that a person probably or possibly has a particular pathology and the test is to confirm or to refute that potential diagnosis, yeah. a differential yeah. diagnosis. I'm often asked by people, what lab should I go and get prior to our meeting? And I say, none at all. Yeah. I want to talk I'm, to you I'm about the same mind because that's, that's interesting because we have this, there's a lot of criticism that I level at the allopathic healthcare system. I think there's a ton. There, we, we're pharmacy focused. We're, but then a lot of people say, well, I'll go to a functional medicine doc. At least they talk about vitamins and minerals. But you go to those guys and the first thing they do is sign up at my website and here, take three thousand dollars worth of labs before you even show up to my house to my office yeah and i'm like why the hell would you do that why won't you at least physically examine the person take an h and p mm. before you start asking for all these crazy labs Get the and we've gotten we've gotten used to for good or bad we, particularly in the u.s we've gotten used to the fact that i'm some well-off guy that wants to take care of my health and i have access to ten thousand dollars worth of labs if i just want to pay for it so i go to the local lab corp and i order the healthy man superman lab panel with seven thousand I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit literally a hundred different lab variables mm -hmm. and you and then you lay it in there and always some of them are going to fall without of a range i've never seen somebody with a large amount of labs at least one value hasn't been out of a range and so what do you do as a functional medicine doc I, here's a i got a supplement for that one and that's part of the that's part of the that's just part of the model and so i i do but i in the, you know, in, in the ideal world, what would you measure better? I think sometimes a tissue biopsy would be more more instructive. Of course, tissue mm. biopsies are painful. They, there's complications associated with it. They're very expensive. You know, we measure labs in the blood. and People don't understand. It. We measure that because it's easy to get. It's easy, tough stuff to get. I guess you could do a hair mineral analysis. or There's other things in there. But mm. we've made a century worth of so almost a whole, there is a whole science behind it, lab science on interpreting these blood values and what they what we think they mean or and is they're very context dependent and i always what's a con because i get people to send me their labs hey doc what do you think about this and i'm like i don't think anything about it i don't know any i don't even know who you are so we got to have some context here 
That's it. Yeah. Now, first present to me with some symptomology. I'll get the history, find out what's going for, on for you, and then I'll respond, hopefully sensibly, as to which way I think is, is the most likely course of action to to improve your your outcomes. And for me, that's why I'm all about these days. I started, so let's circle back. We're just about out of time, so let's circle back to the very beginning. We started out with, I think the carnivore diet correctly formulated is absolutely the most important thing a person can do to increase their lifespan, their health span, their experience of life in general. Get that done. Muscle meat, associated fat, butter, dairy if you don't react negatively to it, eggs if you don't react negatively to those, fill your boots up. That's the diet. Let me just poke you a little bit on this, Bart, because I agree with, I, I largely agree with that. The only thing that you said life expectancy, and I'm, I am very much cautious about making claims about life expectancy. I just don't mm -hmm. know that you can test that. And realistically, no, you can't. You can. you can't. I, and that's why I'm caveating that with, look, this is my formulation based on my experience, both as a scientist and as a clinician. Yeah. How, how old are you now, Bart, just out of curiosity? I'm 52 in March. 52. So I'm 57 next week, next month. So I know more because I'm older. I, I guess we could just go to the oldest guy and say, what did you do? And it's always yeah. funny. You interview these old 112 year olds and I ate bacon and whiskey and smoked every day. <laughs> you know, it's kind of, sure. it's kind of funny. Sure. Who do you listen to? You know, it's yeah. kind of so funny. Look, I, I say lifespan and health span possibility likelihood on the basis that it seems like we are absolutely without question biologically adapted to an obligate hyper carnivore lifestyle as a species. Mm -hmm. yeah. We've only not really been doing that for the last 10,000 years, and that's been absolutely disastrous for human health. Now, you can disagree with me on that. Absolutely, you're welcome to. I don't care. It doesn't change. Well, no, I, I would agree with you that our human, the individual human has mm. the, their quality of their life and their robustness and their vigorousness and their vitality and their just their size has dramatically dropped since the advent of agriculture. And yep. Uh, when that occurred, if it's 10,000 years ago or even preceding that a little bit, I think that's the only point I would say that mm -hmm. I think we, we, I think again, if you listen to guys like Mickey Bendor and whatnot, they would point to about 80,000 years ago as mm -hmm. the point when we started to have to be forced to bow and arrow technology came in then because our main food, the big, juicy, fatty megafauna started to diminish in numbers as we, we grew in size. And then so we, started to chase leaner animals and blah, 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 and then eventually yeah. rely more on plant foods. Mm. So that is, oh, so, I, yeah. I think that's interesting because a lot of people will, of course, the problem is they'll point to hunter-gatherer tribes today. They'll go look at some tribe well, living in Tanzania, people. the Hadza, and the poor Hadza are out there chasing baboons around. Yep. I, I think you back up 100 years and Hans are not eating ba baboons. No, They're eating no. friggin' elephants and rhinos and whatever the hell that they can the get. Hadza, got a lot the Hadza of that, that, that exist today are a modern people they exist today yeah they are not a model for how we were they exactly. just are a group of people who live less technologically based lives than what we do but they exist now so we can't yep. use them as an indication of what was we don't know what was we weren't there unless you look at the stable isotope testing that tells us what human beings did eat slam dunk but that's for another day okay so carnival diet most important thing absolutely get that done you don't need organs the muscle meats of large ruminant animals Plus or minus butter, dairy, and eggs, fine. However, that's not the be all and end all. A lot of people say the carnival diet's all you need. No, I don't think so. I think there are at least four other things that are pretty important that a person should do in their life. Okay. And those things are covered in a video on my channel called Five Life Hacks, where I think the thumbnail is me going five to show you that there's five of them and also to show you the palm of my hand so that I'm trustworthy. Apparently, is that, is that what that means when you show the palm of your hand? You trust me? You're, you're not hiding nothing up your sleeve or something That's like it. that. that yeah. So, if you want to know what those other four life hacks are and the reason why I think they're good, you would watch that in five minutes or less video of mine that says five life hacks. And I think there's some more detailed videos there as well. So I would yeah. I would go and get into that too. I, like I said, I am obviously a pro, an advocate for nutrition and carnivore, particularly. Hmm. I often talk about not being sedentary, getting exercise, getting good sleep, mm -hmm. getting outside. There's mm -hmm. some circadian biology stuff going on that I think yep. is important and relevant. And yep. so I think there are, you're right, there are. It's, you cannot expect do it. In, I think nutrition does a lot. Don't, yep. And I think those other things are less effective if you don't have the nutrition in place, Correct. for sure. Mm -hmm. After you've gone carnivore, where do you go from there if you're not fully resolved? You've got you've to figure out where the rest of those things are. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. then, and the other point about you said about aging, and this is, like I said, while I am 
reluctant to make claims on lifespan. I will tell you, it's been my personal experience that I'm closer now to 60 than I was 50. I am now stronger at this age and just as physically, athletically, cardiorespiratorily as fit as I was then. And that's not the normal situation mm-hmm. for most people in their mid to late 50s. Mm-hmm. You often, unfortunately, the norm these days is pretty damn pitiful. And it's, if you're just above average, you're like, superstar and then all you got to do is not have a pulse you know just about to be above average these days uh, i did one one last question what is the carnivore scene like in new zealand these days is it is it a growing is there a growing interest within that down down there in in new zealand okay i do not have a significantly sized new zealand audience personally mm-hmm i think there are people down here in new zealand who do follow the carnivore way of living Many of the people I'm joint ventured with in in other areas of life and other businesses have taken it on and, and are promoting it and, and are doing it. I think that we've made a scratch on the surface, but there, there's so much more we can do to promote this thing. And I guess as long as I have energy, life, and and it's at least remotely financially viable to continue doing what we're doing, I'll, I will keep doing it because I really genuinely believe that it is our solemn responsibility to correct the falsehoods that are out there. Yeah, amen to that. I, I, I don't disagree with that. I Like I said, I'm all in on sharing this message. I think, you know, you, you can't see it and not. I think it's almost unethical not to do this uh, in a way, particularly when you have the capacity to do this. Obviously, everybody has different jobs and things like that, but my goodness, we are heading to a very worrisome place with, I will take, there are a few victories. I saw in the United States, they just, the, the U.S. Congress or, or House of Representatives voted to reinstate whole milk in the school public school system had it been banned for 20 some years we could all you could get was skim milk and low fat milk and so that's a that's a little bit of a i think i think the cop 28 the unfao did not recommend we change our diet which i think is also did not recommend that we go on the bug based plant gruel diet that pressure is still coming there's still these venture capital people that are just see dollar signs and if we can get you to eat that ultra processed gruel more money for us. And so the fight needs to continue. This is a generational uh, fight for sure. There's no doubt about it. Bart, thank you for being here and and thank you for doing what you do. It's always a pleasure to chat with you. And uh, I look forward to checking in on your channel from time. It's called, what is the channel called? It's called, it used to be called like the nutrition watchdog or something like that. The nutrition science watchdog. Now it's called Professor Bart K main channel, but Uh the kind of working title is Bart K health science as per this t-shirt, which is probably looking backwards to you, but there you go. Okay. I also have a number of other channels on similar and actually quite different topics as well and every one of my youtube channels is linked in the show notes under every one of my videos on my main channel so folks can probably go and find those for themselves and just in closing the final thing i would say is to recommend very strongly that people do check out life hack number two very seriously on my list of five on that video i was referring to earlier And if you want to see some stories and anecdotes around what happens when you do, that's on my channel as well under its own playlist called Adult Stem Cell Related Videos. There you go. Done. Awesome, man. All right. 